Hi everyone, welcome back to the TEFL Training Institute podcast. This week we are looking at interactions that happen in the classroom. We're talking about classroom discourse and to help us do that we have Steve Walsh, Professor of Applied Linguistics at Newcastle University. Steve's written extensively several books and many, many articles about classroom discourse, how it affects student learning, and how teachers can use classroom discourse as a starting point for their professional development. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hi, Steve. Thanks very much for joining us. To begin with, Steve, what is classroom discourse? Well, classroom discourse is the basically covers all the interactions which take place in any classroom and it's used interchangeably quite frequently in the literature. You'll see people talk about interaction, you'll see them talk about classroom discourse. Well, classroom discourse is the actual recording, the observation, the transcript, all of that constitutes classroom discourse. And what we're really interested in and certainly in my work anyway, are the interactions between teacher and students. And the reason we're interested in it is because it shows us what's actually happening in a classroom. It gives us a clue as to whether anything is being taught or learnt. You can't study learning by looking inside people's heads, but you can actually make a lot of inferences, I suppose, by looking at what people do and what people say. So that's that's the kind of the essence of classroom discourse and also one of the reasons for studying it. In terms of those interactions then, like what do we know about what usually or what often happens? I mean, how do teachers typically interact with their students and what are some of the common purposes that teachers use teacher talk for? Sure, yeah, I mean, we're we're interested in the, what you might call the teaching practices which take place in the classroom and all of these practices such as asking a question or correcting an error, these practices are encompassed in language, right? You can't actually do these things without using language. So we have, for example, in in some of my work, which I'll talk about later, we've identified a number of these practices which are frequently occurring, which are found in any classroom anywhere in the world, which merit study. So let's take the most frequently occurring ones, these would be elicitation. So elicitation is about basically trying to get your students to say something by asking a question, for example, which is the most commonly used elicitation strategy. The second one would be repair, which would be the ways in which we correct errors. Something that teachers do all the time is error correction. And there are huge debates, of course, around this as to whether we should correct every error or not. The third one, which is perhaps the most important one in many ways, is feedback. And the feedback that we give to our students and that students give to us is hugely important because it tells us what's going on. And right now, for example, in the current situation with COVID, we're all working online and we're teaching online and we're not getting the feedback that we do depend on from our students. So for example, if we don't get visual clues, if we don't get head nods and smiles and raised eyebrows and these kind of multimodal features, we don't know really whether they're actually understanding us or learning anything. And similarly, the feedback that we give to our students, the ways in which we acknowledge a contribution, for example. So typically teachers say things like, yes, good, thank you, excellent, right, that kind of thing, right? These discourse markers, these simple single words, although they're used to encourage and motivate, they can actually close the interaction down and signal the end of a turn. So although they are well meant, in the work I'm doing, I'm suggesting that we need to push learners a little bit and say things like, oh, that's really interesting. Can you tell us a bit more about that? So we get what I'm calling pushed output, using Meryl Swain's word, output from our students. And finally, you know, all the stuff that we do, which is classed as management of learning, giving instructions, organising, setting up pair work, bringing a task to a conclusion. All of these things are what we would call teaching practices, but they are absolutely interlinked with the language that we use. So what's really important here is to understand 
that the language we use and the pedagogic goal that we're trying to achieve, the pedagogic goal of the moment, they have to work together. So if my pedagogic goal is to promote fluency and I'm simply asking yes, no questions, there's a mismatch between my language and my pedagogic goal. If my pedagogic goal is to give a grammatical explanation about a point of grammar, then it's absolutely fine to talk at length and have what you might call a high level of teacher talk. So we're interested in the quality of teacher talk rather than the quantity. We're interested in the extent to which our language and our interaction promote learning. So maybe we can drill down a bit deeper into some of those concepts then, Steve. I mean, let's go back to questions for a second. I think before we've spoken on the podcast about how useful it is for teachers to ask questions to students that they don't know the answers to. Do you want to tell us a bit more about those kind of questions and and also display questions where teachers ask students questions that they already know the answers to? Are those sometimes useful or sometimes appropriate or, or does it all really just depend? It depends. Well, okay, so in, with regard to questions, we ask a lot of questions, you know. There have been various studies on this to calculate the percentage time that teachers actually devote to asking questions, and it's it's huge, it's enormous. And, and you know, one kind of question for ourselves is perhaps, do we always need to ask a question? Are there other ways of eliciting a response? When I first started teaching, we used to use flashcards, for example, to elicit responses. There are ways of doing this, but let's stay with questions for a minute. Basically, I would would divide questions into two types, display questions and referential questions, right? So display questions are questions that we use to get our students to display what they know. They're a prompt. And display questions are questions that we, as teachers, know the answer to. They're not the kind of question you would ask your family or friends because your family or friends would think you were crazy if you kept asking them questions that you knew the answer to. But in classrooms, it's okay to ask display questions because they prompt and they elicit, they try to encourage some some kind of response. The problem is that we ask too many in my work. We ask a lot of display questions where, in fact, sometimes... We should and could be asking the other type of question, which are referential questions. Referential questions are simply genuine questions that we don't know the answer to. Questions such as, what did you do over the weekend? How did you spend Saturday? Have you ever been to Paris? You know, these types of questions, which are genuine and real, are an essential part of human communication. So, What I'm suggesting is that we need to rebalance questioning and perhaps try to incorporate more genuine questions of our students and fewer display questions. You'll hear people talk about these as open and closed as well. And some people, including my colleague at Newcastle, Paul Seedhouse, would suggest that every question in a classroom is some kind of display question because it's there for a purpose. It's designed to get a response from our students rather than the normal purpose of questions, which is to access information and find out about things. So some people would argue you can't actually ask a genuine question. I think you can, and I think we should, because it shows an interest in our students and it shows that we're listening to what they're saying and we're we're interested, we're genuinely interested. You mentioned there how your friends and family would look at you very strangely if you asked them a display question, you know, what colours this pen, how many shoes are there, that kind of thing. And obviously that that's true, but that suggests that there's a difference between how teachers interact with students inside the classroom and how they interact with other people outside yeah. of the classroom. So can you tell us a bit more about that? And is it ever really possible for classroom interactions to and classroom communication to be similar or to mirror what's going on in the real world? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the simple answer is it can't. Interactions in the classroom are bound by rules. You know, we're, we're talking here, to use a little bit of technical language, we're talking about an institutional discourse setting. An institutional discourse means any situation within an institution which has got its own rules. So, for example, a visit to the doctor. You know, you go to the doctor, it would be unusual for you to say to the doctor, how are you today? 
but it's absolutely fine for the doctor to say to you, how are you and what can I do for you, right? So these rules that apply restrict the kind of interaction that we can have in a classroom. And some people say it's not genuine. But the other way of looking at it is to say that the classroom is as much a social setting as any other. It's a place where people come, they have a goal. All institutional discourse is goal-oriented. We have a purpose for being there. We have roles, and in the in the roles that we have, we have in a classroom, the roles are asymmetrical. They're not equal. So the teacher is the authority figure, and they have control of the discourse, for example. These roles and the, the rules, roles and rules, if you like, in a classroom, restrict the kinds of discourse that we're going to get, and they limit us to certain patterns. But that's actually quite interesting, because then we can say, well, what is an appropriate interaction in a classroom and what is a less appropriate type of interaction? So although, on the one hand, classroom interaction, classroom discourse is not authentic and can never be genuine in the same way that an interaction with a friend can be, on the other hand, it's a social setting which has certain norms and practices which can be studied. And that's what makes it useful in terms of understanding teaching and learning better. So you mentioned there the idea of rules and roles. Let's talk about the roles a little bit more. How sort of set in stone are those teacher roles, Steve? Like they obviously must change a little bit depending on the culture, maybe the part of the world that you're teaching in. But I wonder if they're also influenced by other things like the expectations of students or or even just influenced by what it is that the teachers are, are teaching. Yeah, that's a good question. And and this is really very much about the socialization of learning. That we're all socialized into behaving in certain ways in classrooms, right? Typically, we expect to answer questions rather than ask questions. We expect to sit quietly for much of the time. We we expect to put our hands up when we want to say something or answer a question. These are the rules, if you like, the social rules of the classroom. And of course, these vary from one context to another. If you go to some parts of the world, the Middle East, the Far East, possibly South America, um, places like that, then the role of the teacher is very much seen as a traditional role in some people's eyes. In other words, they are there to impart knowledge. In other parts of the world, the role of the teacher might be seen in quite a different way as somebody who's there as a facilitator, as a catalyst, somebody who can help people learn, but in a more possibly informal way. Now, I don't think these two contexts that I've just described are mutually exclusive. And in the work that I do, I talk about micro contexts, which vary as a lesson progresses. And the teacher's role and the interactions that unfold have to vary according to what's going on in the classroom, according to the agenda, the teaching goals of the moment. So at one point in a lesson, you might be dominating the interaction for 10 or 15 minutes while you give an explanation or give some instructions. At another moment in the lesson, you might be taking more of a back seat and letting the students get on with something and interact together. But what's important, I think, for good teaching is to learn how to vary the role that you adopt and match the role according to what you're trying to achieve with the students at that point in time. And some people are good at this, and I'm afraid some are not. And some people feel that they have to remain as the authority figure, the what the literature would refer to as the sage on the stage, the one who has all the knowledge, especially in language classrooms, I think it's probably a mistake to completely follow that rule. The other thing, of course, is that teachers are are under pressure from outside the classroom. And this perhaps influences their role very strongly as well. They're under pressure from parents, from head teachers, perhaps, the curriculum, assessment and examinations, All these kind of external, invisible or hidden factors have an important effect on how we behave in classrooms and the kind of role that we adopt. One more time, everyone. That was Steve Walsh. If you'd like to find out more from Steve, check out his books and articles. There's a list on Steve's University of Newcastle page, which I'll put a link to. 
If you'd like to find out more from us, please go to our website, www.tefltraininginstitute.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next time. Goodbye.